This is The Causes of Things, and I'm your host, Michael O'Fallon. We are in the process of being transitioned from an analog, objective, real, physical world into a digital, subjective, surreal world. And this process of transformation is happening in every facet of our civilization. But what we are experiencing is a transformation of what is accepted as reality when it isn't reality. It is synthetic. In this discussion enters in John Baudrillard and his understanding of hyperreality and the creation of synthetic reality, which is not reality at all. It is unreality or hyperreality. It is the creation of something that is more real than real. It is beyond propaganda, but certainly propaganda is utilized. But it is the creation of simulacra and simulation. That the insistence that the cartographer's map is the reality as opposed to the reality being the judge of the map. So that those interpret explorers who insist on following the map may inevitably ignore the reality of the topography of the land itself. Now, we do need to understand that Jean Baudrillard was a post-structuralist, and early in his writings, especially during the years dominated by Marcusa, Derrida, and the neo-Marxists, Baudrillard attempted to reconcile Marxism and postmodernism in his early writings, but began to drift away from Marxism later in the 1970s and 80s, seeing the primary problem as the creation of an alternative reality. And in many ways, his observations have been the textbook for those who are creating the alternative realities that are bathed in politically tinged subjectivity today. And in reading Baudrillard, in particular his later writings, you can begin to understand what it is that is being done to us and around us to shape and mold our future, not towards a future that is bathed in truth, trust, and an agreed destination, but to mold our future and to mold what we must agree to be reality, which is not reality. And we must accept this false reality as true or be shunned or banished. And this is what is called hyper-reality. So, according to Baudrillard, what has happened in our postmodern world is that our society has become so reliant on models and maps that we have lost all contact with the real world that preceded the map. Reality itself has begun merely to imitate the model, which now precedes and determines the real world. And this is where he would say, quote, The territory no longer precedes the map nor does it survive it. It is nevertheless the map that precedes the territory, precession of simulacra, that engenders the territory, end quote. And this is where the concept of simulacra and simulation is introduced. And I think you can see this all around you, especially in the last two years, where Baudrillard postulates the following, quote, It is no longer a question of imitation, nor duplication, nor even parody. It is a question of substituting the signs of the real for the real, end quote. Let me see if I can help you to understand hyperreality in an easy-to-understand story whose original was started through a friend named Wokel Distance and has been explained several times by Dr. James Lindsay. But let me just lay this out for you in a way that may help you to make clear what seems to be very obscure with simulacra and simulation and the unreality of hyperreality. So please bear with me for just a moment. Let's go back in time. Imagine that 60 years ago, there was an older grandfather walking his grandson through the fields of the family's strawberry farm. A strawberry farm that was known for the best strawberries anywhere in the United States. And as he is taking his young grandson down the dirt road, back to the fields, he stops and stoops down to his grandson and says, quote, 
grandson, do you want to taste the very best strawberry in the world? End quote. And the grandfather picks a fresh strawberry from the patch and hands it to his grandson. The young boy bites into the juicy strawberry. And wow, the taste of that fresh picked strawberry from the family farm was the best thing that the young boy had ever tasted. The moment of eating that incredible strawberry made such an impression on the young boy that, as he became a young man and went to college, he wanted to do everything that he could to bring everyone in America to love and appreciate strawberries. Soon, he decided to expand the family business by mashing up the farm strawberries, adding sugar and cornstarch for thickness, and then putting the strawberry jam in mason jars and getting the family strawberry farm jam out to local produce markets. Well, the jam was such a success that stores all over the nation wanted the family strawberry farm jam. But now some preservatives and a little sugar needed to be added in to make the strawberry jam just slightly sweeter. But it brings out the taste of the original strawberry. And then someone approaches the young man about adding the family strawberries to ice cream. And so you have strawberry ice cream now. And then, a candy maker wanted to brand their new strawberry candy with the family strawberry farm name to sell more of their strawberry candy. And so now the man agrees to take the chemicals and the elements that taste strawberry-like from his strawberries, and then they can have strawberry-flavored candy, but without the strawberries. Now, it wasn't too long after that that the most successful soda makers in America said to the now middle-aged man, Hey, we want to make your strawberry farm name the center of our new strawberry soda by taking the essence of the strawberry flavor that makes your strawberry so famous, enhance that flavor, and put it into our soda line. And so the soda pop with the famous family strawberry farm name is the most famous strawberry-flavored soda in the United States. But the soda, it doesn't contain any real strawberries in the product. Nothing actually from the famous family's strawberry farm. So you had a real strawberry, which then had additives added into it to create the jam, that then had chemical extracts of the strawberry and more sugar and preservatives to make the candy that then had another layer of removal from the reel to make the soda. And now you are in the hyper-reel. Now, 60 years later, the once young boy is now the grandfather. And his little grandson is just crazy for the family farm-associated strawberry soda, the family's strawberry candy the family's strawberry-flavored cereal. And he tells his grandfather, quote, Granddad, I love strawberries, end quote. And so the grandfather says, Hey, I have a real treat for you, grandson. Let's go for a walk on the family estate, and I am going to take you to the original strawberry patch where my grandfather gave me a taste of my very first strawberry. They're in season right now and perfectly ripe. End quote. And so the grandson is excited and walks down the same dirt road that his grandfather walked 60 years ago. And with the golden sun setting across the strawberry fields, the grandfather stoops down and picks the juiciest strawberry and hands it to his grandson and says, quote, Now try the best thing that you have ever tasted. And the grandson takes the strawberry and bites into it. And all of a sudden, the boy's face wrinkles up. He spits out the freshly picked strawberry and shouts, Yuck! What is that? That's disgusting! 
That doesn't taste anything like your strawberry soda, your strawberry candy, or the strawberry Slurpee that I had earlier today. This is the grossest thing that I've ever tasted. And the grandfather replied, But grandson, that is the real, the real strawberry. And the grandson replied, The real strawberry to me is the strawberry in the soda. That is my real strawberry, not that thing you just pulled out of the dirt. And now you know what hyperreal is. What the young grandson was told was strawberry in his young life didn't even have the properties of what real strawberry is. He had a simulacra of strawberry in his mind. In the young boy's experience, strawberry was what was found in the soda, in the cereal, in the candy, not in the real strawberry. He had a simulacra of strawberry in his mind. It didn't even have the real properties of what the real strawberry is. It wasn't the real, the real, the authentic, the original. The original, the real, disgusted the young boy. The boy loved the simulacra of the strawberry and not the real strawberry itself. The last product in the descending line of copy after copy began to lose the real element and eventually had no relation to the original at all. But then, those that are first introduced to the signifier or idea of strawberry through strawberry soda, well, that is real strawberry to them. But it has no real element of the original true definitive strawberry. This can also be seen with what represents reality on social media, let's say. And so you will have young men and especially young women who will find the perfect angle with the perfect outfit, with the perfect lighting and the perfect ISO to snap a selfie of themselves. And then that photo of themselves is loaded into Photoshop. And then the process of simulation begins. And so the blemishes are removed. Skin tone is improved. Wrinkles are erased. Certain body parts are enhanced, while other areas of the body, like the waist, hips, etc., are reduced. Glowing is added. And finally, what is posted on Instagram or Facebook is a simulacra of the real person. It bears no resemblance to the original. But to those millions of followers of that woman, this is the real that they know. And so that unreal, real woman must put every photo through this process every single time. And what you have is a woman who is fake an avatar of the original. And even the men or boys that follow that woman on Instagram are attracted to a non-reality, which to them is the hyper-reality that they desire, a synthetic reality. And we have now arrived at a distorted copy of reality. But it is the hyper-reality, this synthetic hegemony, that is directing our perceptions of today. Another example of this hyperreality, this simulacra, would be the one that is literally just one mile away from where I am right now. An example that I have to hear nightly as the fireworks display is ignited on a nightly basis. Disney World. A land of the hyperreal. A theme park where everything resembles something that was or is or should be. But it is better than the real. It is the main street of the United States with all the joy, happy music, smells of the state fair and the whistle of the perfect train come to whisk you away. It is the land of adventure with perfectly manicured tropical foliage, with beautiful waterfalls, with animals that roar but do not bite with pirates that entertain you, but do not attempt to kill you. The land of fantasy, where everything is a small world, where children all over the world sing with one voice, but do not face the pain, 
danger and fear of the actual world. It is hyper-real. It is a simulacra of the real. A heightened simulation. And Disney World can be understood as a copy of a copy, or a simulacrum to the second power. As author Umberto Eco noted about Disney World, quote, At Disney Parks, we not only enjoy a perfect imitation, we also enjoy the conviction that imitation has reached its apex, and afterwards, reality will always be inferior to it. End quote. And I know of many men and women of my age who spend months out of the year in Walt Disney World because it represents to them the way that things ought to be, the way that they should be. And unfortunately, reality will never live up to it. And it is the non-reality, as long as it exists, that provides their mind with an unexplainable solace. So Disney represents a symbol of the real, but is pushed so far past what the reality can be that it isn't just symbolic of the real, not just an idol, but something completely separated from what it claims to represent. So what we would see from Baudrillard's examples of symbols that successively lead to simulacra is a progression of layers that step by step lead us into the hyper-real. And let's think again of Wokel Strawberry as the example. But here's the steps and the phases of coming out of reality into hyperreality. Well, first, you would start with the real, the actual object itself, the objective reality. The next phase in the road to the hyperreal is the reflection. This phase is a good reflection or faithful copy of the original. But then the next phase is the mask. This phase is a perverted appearance or an unfaithful copy of the original. But then you descend down to the next phase. And the next phase is the illusion. This is a cover-up pretending to be a faithful copy of the original, but it is not. And then the final phase is pure simulacra, which has no relation to reality or the objective reality that you began with. And so this last phase of pure simulacra is where hyperreality appears. Hyperreality is significantly akin to the notion of simulacrum, which is a copy without any relation to its original. And in our postmodern era that we live in, Information technology and cybernetics have produced so many simulations due to who is attempting to control or dominate our life that we cannot distinguish the original from the copy. And when you are living a life where you are interacting with the environment around you, and that environment is simulacra as opposed to reality, well, in other words, that, that environment, that media, that news, that institution that you used to trust for truth is fake. It's hyper real. It's a simulacra of what used to at least reflect the truth. Then you really are not a person who is in control of your life anymore, if that's how you base the way that you live your life and the decisions that you make. So you are subject to the false reality that those that seek to control you are imposing on you. In our current postmodern era that we find ourselves in today in 2022, and what you have been experiencing over the past few years, the political hierarchy is not the main concern anymore. The hegemony starts with cultural and social penetration. And this cultural invasion is surrounded by wider social, economic, and political values that are embedded in the global movement of postmodernism. So you, the person who is being yanked around and controlled by mass formation psychosis by manipulations of reality, well, those simulations are designed according to no external realities. They're designed according to simulacras. 
They cannot be falsified or objectively proven through the scientific method. We've discussed this before many, many times in the podcast. So, in other words, the scientific method is the enemy of the simulation of reality. And now, the attempt is to give us all new identities based upon pure simulacra. Let me repeat that. Right now, the attempt is to give us all new identities based upon pure simulacra. Maybe that's starting to make sense now. Perhaps, let's say, upon your acceptance or non-acceptance of an experimental medical procedure. And so, these rootless, non-referential, unattainable simulations give us new identities, and they are designed for specific purposes, such as imperialistic or enviro-communo-fascist supranational goals. So when we start to examine what is happening around you right now, this very moment, and how these Pygmalion processes of creating hyperreality out of operational goals, how they're actually ruling our current society. Let's think through the current societal orthodoxy of the trans movement in our world. A trans beauty queen who must be accepted as a woman. A trans model who must be embraced for his or her femininity or masculinity. And so we understand that the trans beauty queen could never arrive at the point of winning Miss USA beauty pageant without synthetically altering the chemical makeup and hormone construction of the beauty queen's physiology. They couldn't appear the way that they do without significant surgical operations to their breasts, and many times as well to their face and other areas of their body. They couldn't naturally pass for a woman who wins a beauty contest without unnatural hair and other accompaniments associated naturally with women. They are a simulacra. They bear no actual representation of the real. But they are more woman than woman. In fact, many in the trans community spend more time and effort on their physical appearance to appear as a beautiful woman than do actual women. And with actual women, women are being told by the radical feminists around them to dress down, to stop appearing beautiful, to stop highlighting their femininity. And at the same time, men are being told to curb their toxic masculinity. So you have men who are not being men and women who are not acting naturally in a society as women. And they are being told that the whole men and women thing is just a social construct. And of course, we are told that men flirting harmlessly with women is now rape. So men and women don't speak with one another anymore. And what is normalized is that women that act like men, and men that act like women, and women that act like men. And never shall the two meet in a natural God-designed real way where you have dangerous men who are masculine, who protect the women in their lives and in society, and women who are beautiful, who inspire those men, who raise their children and become the bedrock of what makes society move and have it be sacrificial. Well, that's all gone. Because now you have a simulacra of male and female, of men and women, and both sexes are completely confused and angry about their lives. They are both completely frustrated with the way things are. And that is because they have bought the lie that it is now absolutely controlling all of their actions. Now let's move out of the micro and into the macro. Is the United States the real constitutional republic that was based upon the vision of the founding fathers and the Lockean vision? Or are we now a simulacra of the symbols of the United States that have no relation or even a reflection of the constitutional underpinnings of our nation? Does the Supreme Court take cases brought before it and ensure that the decisions that they render reflect the original authorial intent of the framers of the Constitution? Or are they creating straw men and fanciful ideas that lead them to make decisions based upon their political goals? of disrupting and dismantling the nation. Now, the Supreme Court justices like Sotomayor, Kagan, and others wear the robes traditionally worn by the justices. So they look like Supreme Court justices. They occupy the seats traditionally occupied by previous justices. They still loosely use the process of argumentation used by judges and attorneys through the years. But their reasoning and their interpretation has nothing to do with 
reality. And their reasoning and their interpretation have nothing to do with the original document that is supposed to be the mirror by which those cases are to be judged. They are hyper-real. They bear no resemblance and no qualities of the original. They are fake, making fake decisions. They bear no resemblance whatsoever to the original model of interpreting law to find if the case in question passes constitutional muster. They are a law unto themselves. And every politician in the United States House, in the Senate, and serving in the executive branch, swears to uphold and defend the Constitution of the United States, and then promptly does everything that they can to violate the Constitution of the United States and deconstruct our nation to prepare for one world global hyperreal hegemony. And so our politicians that serve the hyperreal are simulacras of real politicians. And as I have said in the past episodes of our podcast, do remember that Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez is a woman that responded to a casting call to be a United States representative. This is no joke. AOC responded to a casting call to be a United States representative to play a role in a grand play. I'm not exaggerating when I say this. And each day, just like an actor in a soap opera, she receives her scripts, plays her role, and recites her lines. She is a simulacra of a congressional representative. And she is part of a union of actors and actresses on the Democratic side of things. Democrats that praise the destruction of cities, the burning of businesses, the surrounding and threatening attack on the White House back in June of 2020, the assault on police officers and secret service agents back in June of 2020, the looting of businesses and the violence on the streets that made June of 2020 what it was. The Democrats encouraged that violence because it was your town, because it was your business that was attacked, because it was your police officers that were assaulted. And then they created a hyper-real situation with all the accompanying hyperbole and exaggeration to simulate an attack on their house and even used federal agents and officers to encourage the goofy and ridiculous riot. But it bore no resemblance to what happened in Minnesota or what happened in Charleston or what happened in Santa Monica or what happened in New York in May and June of 2020, because that is really where the seat of power is. You see, it isn't supposed to be in Washington, D.C. So they created a hyper-real event, and everyone had to respond as if the hyper-real event was a violent attempt to overthrow the simulacra government that was now installing their new hyper-real president. And the simulated Republicans, of course, have to feign false rage against the simulated attack in order to continue to move the simulated nation into the total global simulacra that eventually awaits, because they're necessary for the dialectic to continue. And the plans and goals of those that seek to be our overlords are complete and total simulacra. A global climate crisis that will end the world as we know it within 10 years if we don't do everything that we can right now to change everything that we do and become an enviro-communo-fascist supranational state. A public-private partnership between the ruling supranational state and the worldwide corporate structure. That's what we must follow. And they will tell us that we must, we must stop driving our cars. We must stop eating meats. We must stop having children. We must enforce diversity, equity, and inclusion. We must stop traveling by air, by sea. We must accomplish climate justice. We must know where everyone is at all times digitally. Because this is all for your safety. And to save the planet. Because we're all in this together. Like good collectivists like good communists. This is all simulacra. It bears no resemblance to the truth of anything, and its purposes are for totalitarian control. A simulacra of a pandemic was created, and every possible therapy that was effective was declared dangerous. 
In doctor's offices across the nation, positively tested people were told to go home, drink lots of water, and take Advil, and then go to the hospital if they have symptoms later on. So there's no prevention of symptomatic development by the majority of doctors in the United States. And how do you think we got to where we are going with this thing? And of course, the only prescribed solution to the end of said medical emergency was an experimental medical procedure that is ineffective and comparatively dangerous to the therapies. A simulacra of an emergency. And that simulation and role play has to be done in every workplace, in every airport, in every restaurant, in every cruise ship. You can't go into another country without proof that you are obediently embracing the simulacra of the emergency. And if you dare speak against the reality that this is all non-reality, then you will be shunned and removed from your job. You will be shunned from society with almost a religious fervor. You must embrace the hyper-reality that surrounds you and reject reality. Reality and objective truth have no place in the new hyper-real world. Those that insist on the scientific method, on actual knowable truth, are heretics, non-citizens of the new simulated global citizen movement that is being created. And if you don't embrace the simulacra, if you don't accept their global Disney world, and since they are destroying your world around you, they have another world of simulation and stimulation that you can virtually exist in. It's called the metaverse. And this is where they want to drive you as your real world is dismantled around you. They would like you to be perpetually distracted. And if you insist on interacting with life and reality, you will be hated, shunned, and discharged from society. So you must insist upon dealing with actual objective facts. You must learn to recognize the hyperreal. And we must, as a society and nation, move back into the real. Into reality. And in reality, where reality is demanded, it is the truth that will rule the day. I'm Michael O'Fallon, and this has been The Causes of Things.